Hello, welcome to Philosophy Roulette. We're broadcasting now. It's 117, and I barely recognize myself because I shaved. I'm looking at a little preview here. Um, but yeah, here's where we get philosophy off the internet, and we read and review it live for the unknown public's pleasure. So, you know, I was thinking, might we haven't done this in a while. I'll go to Phil Archive and uh, see what the latest updates just to the uh, database are, and we can see what is going on here. So, I also hooked it up so even things that are even shorter, only eight pages, I'll get a search on that as opposed to anything else. So, current opinion in behavioral science, that sounds very sciencey. Philosophy today, task of philosophy in the present age, a lecture. See if anything is like eight pages or less. Just want to uh, try this out for a sec. Ethical perspectives on advances in Biogerontology, interesting, aging medicine. Let's see what else we got. Russell's second philosophy of time. Comes to Audre, the L Wittgenstein Society. Uh, you know, let's click on that, take a look at what's being said there. I mean, if these are just historical things, I don't want to read them because I have no comment on just hetero historical things. International Journal for the History of Chemistry. See, that's cool too, but it's history or chemistry. No philosophy for me to really say. It uh, so looks like a review. Um, Journal of Nietzsche Studies, interesting. Uh, the zombie mocking all nomological arguments. Hmm, I don't know what that is. It's from 2018. So it's interesting because uh, this is just what's been uploaded, so it's not... Um, it, it's not a... Uh, current necessarily current things it's just what has been uploaded recent recently so that's a different sort of thing than uh the front page of uh phil papers because a lot of that stuff is forthcoming uh, let's see let's see what's new on um that that anyway all right so we've got nikolay milkov on russell's second philosophy of time uh, basic to new philosophy and later called philosophy of logical adamant. Yes, yeah, this is historical, which is cool, but like, I mean, I don't have much to say on exposition. Uh, Alright, so this is supposed to be uh, arguing against zombies, seeing zombies off. Let's uh, take a quick gander at what this is. Uh, this is interesting. I mean, it's like they're breaking stuff down by paragraph. That's kind of cool, but huh? This is like should be like a little bite-sized philosophy. So okay, answer to this. Oh, maybe that's what this is. So this is a uh, uh, this is a response paper. Interesting. Okay, and then we've got APA News on Philosophy and the Black Experience. Let's see what this is like. All right. Oh, this is a, oh, uh, okay, so, review essay. Interesting. Okay, so they're reviewing this uh, book. All right, so it's a review. All right. It was worth a shot, just seeing what was eight pages. Oh, uh, okay. Acta Analytica. Thinking animals are thinkers. Oh, that's where we went wrong this morning when I made a mistake. Anyway, let's keep going. That's uh, Anyway, AI and Society read a bunch of stuff from them. Argumentation. I don't know if I've read anything from Argumentation. Let's take a look at that journal. Let's see if anything's forthcoming. All right. So definite descriptions and argument. Gettier's ten coins example. Yusuf Yakubu. We've got whataboutism and inconsistency. Hmm. Uh, Edo and psycho inference and argument here. Topic space, but all right, whatever. An argument from similitude in Martin Luther King Jr.'s deliberative descent from war. Let's see. Introduction. 
Um, no, not gonna just read a summary paper. Argument in Mencius on so on uh, Chinese philosophy. I believe Mencius was Chinese. Uh, defining argument. Comments on Goodman. Um, critical reaction to it. I don't want a critical reaction because a lot of times that's just a. Uh, this is the same as above. Okay, so let's take a look what we got. So this is something on Gettier, uh, but it's not available, so we don't read it. Uh, what aboutism? Mm, uh, this is something else, all right, not available, so we don't read that one. This is even shorter. This is four pages, but it's not even available. Uh, this is getting frustrating. I hate when things are not available. Uh, force me to go back to like old staples or whatever business ethics quarterly business ethics a European review okay so let's see what business ethicists have to say if anything mm, nothing short enough and let's see about this one Uh, no page numbers here. Let's just go back to there. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, blockchain and business ethics. Let's see what that says. Virtuous guidance in getting your paper published. All right, let's just take a look at it because I don't know what this is. This could be interesting. Which one is this? This was blockchain and business ethics. That's this one. Oh my god. Oh, this is a double, double eyed. So I have to go like half. Okay, this is a little too long because this is going to be 24 pages. So, you know what I can do? I just fix that problem today. Alright, so this is even half. So this is for. Uh, the question marks show me which ones are uh, even half as long as the other ones. Uh, vision for beer. Did you say something about beer? Beer. Yeah, but it's only two pages, but that doesn't mean I won't look at it now. And that's it. Only these two things. I want to get your paper published. Mm, nope. Not available. And, oh, this is by the same person or something. Oh, is this just the uh, total oh, citation? Nope. Classical quarterly. Again, I don't want to just look at history of stuff. Cognition tends to be too science-y, but let's take a look at it. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, I see laboratory episodes. Oh, I can't do the page numbers here. I don't know what this is. Uh, the page numbers are busted, so I have no idea how long stuff is. Okay. Kantian philosophy. Kantians don't tend to write short papers. Well, I should go find someone. Let's see if they have some here. And they don't have any of them. Okay. Criminal law and philosophy. Critical discourse, though. Oh, wrong language for me. Special issue, in memoriam, review, review. Oh dear, I'm having lots of trouble today. You know what, let's go to philosophy and literature. That was a, uh, they had well written papers at least. <laughs> like last one I read, uh, read, it was actually quite a, it was nicely written. So I like reading something that I don't have to stumble over. Um, so let's see. All right, what, oh, that was the one I already read, and let's see if there's another one, a uh, response. All right, let's see, and let's see if there's something that's maybe a little longer, but still reasonable. Okay, so this is a, a speech out of place, Macbeth. 
Let's see what else we got. Valentine's card from Far From the Madding Crowd and Art of Moral Evaluation. Well, see, these sound so much fun. Uh, it's just Daniel Defoe, Wolf and Schopenhauer. Oh, yeah. Almost poetic. Prose rhythm in George Berkeley's series. So we'd be getting some like aesthetics here. This is seven pages. Oh, I read that one. I was like, oh, that looks good. Okay. On the truth of literature. Okay, this is 15. I'm not gonna do it. Looks like there's plenty of stuff to um, see if I can figure it, find. All right, so let's see. Nope. Well, at least no. See what if anything's here or not. No. Wow, come on, people. Upload your papers. Okay, so let's see what we got. Respond. Okay, so that's good. We thank you, R. Glassberg. Uh, uh, we thank you, other person, whoever this one is. Speech out of place. William Irwin, so we got this one. All right. Let's see what else we got. Oh, how nice. Okay, so most of these appear. Oh, maybe they all are possible to uh, access or are they all gonna go like blurry as soon as I uh oh no oh okay so this is looking very nice this content has been declared free to read by the publisher during the COVID-19 pandemic thank you publisher not that uh okay so this is like special aspect uh, access all right, so I don't want to read the response paper because I don't know who that is. But so now we get to choose between all these gray papers. Despairing Macbeth, this speaks out of place. It's a Valentine with a giant S card. Far from the Madden crowd, an act of moral evaluation. I, I'm kind of going to do this one because we were just talking about moral evaluation and aesthetic evaluation the other day. This one also looks cool, Wolf and Schopenhauer, so I'm going to move that one up. All right, I don't know enough about this stuff to begin with. I don't know. Well, this, it's always nice to do a something out of my area like feminist philosophy would always be good um so but this is a 17 page paper so i don't care 16 pages this is 17 as well oh these are all 17 what am i complaining about all right um let's see i want to do the art act art of moral evaluation and artistic theory and practice all right let's do this one why not Virginia Woolf and Schopenhauer. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. Say la vie. If you are want to get the link, you can type exclamation point uh, exclamation point paper in the chat box. And uh, this link will pop back up whenever you do that and you'll get to this page and you can just click on find on scholar and then Hopefully it'll still be available. Maybe not once COVID-19 passes, but usually these things are, uh, once they're online, you can't get rid of them. So hopefully it'll just be that way. Okie dokie, and we're off. Virginia Woolf mentions the philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer by name only once in her writings in a book review published in the Times Literary Sub supplement in 1917. Viscount Haberton, author of the book she is reviewing, argues initially that knowledge gained from books is inferior to that derived from practical experience, but later makes a special case for two writers, Schopenhauer and Herbert Spencer. No praise is too high for them, comments Wolf sarcastically. In their books, we are told we shall find the secret of the universe. After all, then, Lord Her Harberton is merely one of those cultivated people who play the innocent for a holiday. Still, one reader will give him the benefit of the doubt and will take his and take his advice to the extent of refraining for ever from the pages, refraining forever from the pages of Schopenhauer. To take this statement seriously would be to disregard the facetious tone of the review and dismiss as pointless any further investigation of Wolf's interest in Schopenhauer. 
It would also be to ignore Wolf's repeated echoes of Schopenhauer, both in her essay and, to, and in To the Lighthouse, the novel in which her interest in the German philosopher is most readily apparent. A careful study of these echoes reveals a definite link between Schopenhauer's metaphysical theory and Wolf's artistic theory and practice. In one of her best-known essays, Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, Wolf comments that Stern and Jane Austen were interested in things in themselves, in character in itself, but the Edwardians were never interested in character in itself. They were interested in something outside. Wolf's use of the term things in themselves and her insistence on the importance of the individual's inner life recall Schopenhauer's repeated use of the phrase think the thing in itself in his writings as well as the belief that introspection reveals a higher truth than perception. By the thing in itself, he means a blind striving force found everywhere in nature, a force he refers to as will. Yeah, but I mean, thing in itself is not unusual for many philosophers, so. So, why is this particularly related to Schopenhauer here? The whole phenomenal world, says Schopenhauer, is the objectivity of the one indivisible will, will permeates all animate and inanimate objects and is responsible for their phenomenal characteristics. It exists in man as the will to live the w and the will to survive, propagate, seek pleasure and avoid pain, and objectifies itself in our bodies. Teeth, throat, and bowels, says Schopenhauer, are objectified hunger. The organs of generation are objectified sexual desire. The grasping hand, the hurrying feet, correspond to the more indirect desires of the will which they express. Perception reveals, reveals only will's indirect objectification, idea, a simplified version of will's phenomenal manifestation. Will itself is imperceptible. For Schopenhauer, our everyday image of the world as idea is of less interest than our experience of the thing in itself, which we can gain from introspection. Whereas perception simplifies our experience of sense data, introspection presents us with direct awareness of the will in action. The knowledge of the will in Self-consciousness, says Schopenhauer, is not a perception of it, but a perfect, direct becoming aware of its successive impulses. So, is this sort of like um, an inference to a uh, will? Uh, not uh, okay. So, yeah. So, okay, whatever. With this in mind, he argues that the inner world should be the primary source of fiction because introspection provides the novelist with insights of greater significance than those revealed by perception. In one of his essays, he comments that a novel will be of a high and noble order, the more it represents of inner and the less it represents of outer life, and the ratio between the two will supply a means of judging any novel of whatever kind, from Tristram Shandy down to the crudest and most sensational tale. Skill consists in setting the inner life in motion with the smallest possible array of circumstance, for it is this inner life that really excites our interest. The business of the novelist is not to relate great events, but to make small ones interesting. This passage is consistent both with Wolf's theory of fiction expressed in her essays and with her practice in To the Lighthouse, where she chooses, as Schopenhauer says above, not to regulate great, relate great events, but to make small ones interesting. In modern fiction, she argues that three Edwardian novelists, Arnold Bennett, H.G. Wells, and John Galsworthy, are materialists whose con consuming preoccupation with the outer world is hopelessly misguided. These novelists write conventionally about outer experience, the right of unimportant things, Wolf emphasizes. They spend immense skill and immense industry making the trivial and the transitory appear the true and enduring. James Joyce, by contrast, is spiritual. He is concerned at all costs to reveal the flickering of that innermost flame which flashes in its message through the brain, and in order to preserve it, he disregards any of the signposts for which generations have served to support the imagination of a reader when called upon to imagine what he can neither touch nor see. Yeah. The true and enduring are to be found in the inner world as revealed by introspection, and the best novelists convey this unknown and uncircumscribed spirit with as little mixture of the alien and exterior as possible. Such novelists provide us with insight into the dark places of psychology, into life or spirit, truth or reality, and ultimately into the essence of human nature itself. Okay, just a side note. Reading this long paragraph was way easier than many of the analytic philosophers I read. Even though it's got lots of big words in it, these big words are a lot, they're better placed in the sentence, and so I can actually read this. And uh, sort of part of the... Uh, effect of reading philosophy out loud for the first time is that you've got words and uh, concepts you're not used to seeing, but at least I can read this one. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'm 117 in here, and so you notice the difference in philosophy when it can be read out loud easily versus when you can't. And I wonder if there's any deep meaning to that, which there probably isn't, but there is a difference there. According to Schopenhauer, higher truths than those revealed by perception are attainable not only through introspection, but also through aesthetic contemplation. What distinguishes aesthetic contemplation from ordinary perception is that the former is independent of will-motivated considerations. See, that's interesting. Will-motivated. I was going to say well, but that's will-motivated considerations. Perceiving an object in nature is a matter of noting various spatio-temporal relationships, ultimately in the interest of the will to live, the will to satisfy appetites, seek pleasure, and avoid sources of pain. But if circumstances are such that individual an individual can lose himself in the disinterested contemplation of object of beauty, forgetful of considerations of will, he or she will cease to be a will-motivated subject and become, mystically, a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge at one with the object of contemplation. Correspondingly, the object will cease for the viewer to be mere idea and become a more direct objectification of will. Idea with capital I. Instead of being an opinion based on sensation, the contemplated object is now a step closer to being will itself, for it has become an atemporal object of true knowledge. If the object is a human being, the willless subject will discern the special idea, capital I, with the individual concerned, that is, the idea expressive of his innermost character. Okay, so somehow, in this aesthetic contemplation, you loo you get a more direct um, access to the object, uh, the object outside and the will inside somehow commingle, I guess. The artist has a particular talent for discerning the atemporal world that lies behind ordinary perceptual appearances. He lets us see the world as idea through his eyes, says Schopenhauer, that he has these eyes and that he knows the inner nature of things apart from all their relations, is the gift of genius is inborn. When he sick, reveals his experience of the world as idea in his art, the artist also reveals something of himself, for in the act of contemplation, he is at one with the object, as we have seen, as a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge. Wolf echoes Schopenhauer in her essay on Oliver Goldsmith, where she describes Goldsmith as having the born writer's gift of being in touch with the thing itself and not with the outer husks of words. What she means is that Goldsmith was able to see beyond the world as idea, as described by the outer husks of words, to the inner nature of things, to the world as idea. She echoes the above passage from Schopenhauer again on her, in her essay on George Moore. His only as the writer sees people, she says there, that we can see that we can see them. His fortunes, color, and his oddities shape his vision until what we see is not the thing itself, but the thing seen and the seer inextricably mixed. Similarly, on not knowing Greek, I don't know Greek, maybe I should read that essay, she notes that by the bold and running use of metaphor, Aeschylus will amplify and give us not the thing itself, but on the reverberation and reflection which, taken into his mind, the thing has made close enough to the original to illustrate it, remote enough to heighten and enlarge and make it splendid. The best writers, in brief, have access to the world as idea, either through introspection or aesthetic contemplation. The latter is the experience of being at one with the object of contemplation, and it follows from this that writers reveal something of themselves in describing what they have learned about world as idea. Wolf uses the phrase, the thing itself, in Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown, Modern Fiction, and her other essays and reviews where, depending on context, Schopenhauer might have preferred the thing in itself. Uh, so we've got in itself down here and thing itself up here will or idea. It seems unlikely that in doing so, Wolf was seeking to disguise the fact that she had sworn in her review of Viscount Harbert Harbert's book never to read Schopenhauer. Mr. Bennett and Mrs. Brown was published seven years after the review, and modern fiction eight years after it. Few readers will have remembered her earlier facetious comment. A more important reason for using the phrase the thing itself was to avoid being attacked or having misunderstood Schopenhauer. Wolf would, well, Look, there's a lot of related things here, too. It may not have just been only Schopenhauer. Wolf would have been self-conscious about her lack of formal training in philosophy and would, have also want, and would have wanted to maintain her status as an independent thinker. This last consideration becomes more obvious in the light of her attitude toward Freud. I mean, it, it seems a little unfair, because, like, 
the thing in itself and the thing itself are in more than just Schopenhauer. So it could be hearkening back to Schopenhauer, but there could be other things too uh, that it harkens to. And so the fact that she... I'm not saying it isn't because it was she was trying to avoid Schopenhauer. It's just because maybe she was trying to be more general. So having... I just wouldn't... Uh, like, I'm a little... How would you know if she was worried about being mis misunderstood about Schopenhauer versus maybe she was just trying to broaden her base there as um, appealing to multiple authors that had related ideas. Schopenhauer may have been the chief among them, but it just doesn't seem that... Uh, it's, not as, uh, it's not such an uncommon phrase in philosophy. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know about anything about self-consciousness, but maybe it did have something to do with Freud. In a recent essay, Maud Elman has shown that although Wolf claimed not to have read Freud until 1939, this avoidance must have cost her some effort. Given that her late husband, Leonard Wolf, was an early champion of Freud, her brother, Adrian Stephen, and his wife, Karen, were practicing psychoanalysis, <laughs> psychoanalysts, and James Drake, the brother of her close friend, Lytton, had not only traveled to Vienna with his wife, Alix, to be analyzed by Freud, but had returned as Freud's official English translators. So, yeah, <laughs> okay, in that case, she is uh, probably full of, full of it, as it were. You don't have to read somebody if everyone around you is talking about them. To the lighthouse, which contains a plethora of phallic symbols, Wolf seems, says Elliman, to be poking fun at mind doctors because she wants to suggest that she has her own independent views about human behavior. <laughs> she, yeah, she's definitely, if she, yeah, maybe she hasn't read it because she's heard all these people go on and on about it and then she makes fun of them, which just seems like a very normal thing to do. Okay. By contrast, Wolf never ridicules Schopenhauer, even though she sometimes finds grounds to depart from his theories. She disagrees with him, for example, when it comes to the question of how much we can learn about our minds. So she agrees with Freud then. When engaged in introspection, Schopenhauer says the will falls under in, falls asunder into subject and object. For even in self-consciousness, the I is not absolutely simple, but consists of a knower, the intellect, and a known, the will. The former is not known, and the latter does not know, though both unite in the consciousness of an I. But just on this account, that I is not thoroughly intimate with itself, as it were transparent, but is opaque and therefore remains a riddle of itself. This problem, in brief, that the investigating I investigates all except itself, so cannot know itself in its entirety, is compounded by the fact that the I only becomes aware of the successive impulses of will, and never the whole of Never the will as a whole. As we have seen, Wolf believes that the best writers of fiction have the ability to provide us with insight into the dark places of psychology, into life or spirit, truth or reality, and ultimately into the essence of human nature itself. In contrast, Schopenhauer, in contrast to Schopenhauer, she believes that there is no limit on what we can learn about the mind. Uh, okay, so what's the real distinction right here? Uh... Okay, so we can somehow, this direct access, I mean, Schopenhauer says you can't because, it, well, this would be a logical problem where the uh, indexical is not going to be able to, you can refer to yourself, but then as something else. Um, yeah, well, but then, it, it, I guess the, the question here is, what is it to learn and what does uh, Schopenhauer mean there about what is it to uh, analyze? Maybe maybe the uh, concept of analysis is wrong. We, uh, it will, I wouldn't say wrong, it's just they're using a different concept of analysis, where she is allowing a sort of a direct insight, um, where Schopenhauer is doing a analysis where you have to sort of like bracket things and look at it, but then how, from what position do you get that? Okay. Another variation of Schopenhauer appears in A Sketch of the Past, where Wolf describes, The rapture I get when in writing I seem to be discovering what belongs to what, making a scene come right, making a character char come together. From this I reach what I might call a philosophy. At any rate, it is a constant idea of mine, that behind the cotton wool is hidden a pattern, that we, I mean all human beings, are connected with this, that the whole world is a work of art, that we are all parts of the work of art. Hamlet, or a Beethoven quartet, is the truth about this vast mass that we call the world. But there is no Shakespeare, there is no Beethoven, certainly and emphatically there is no God. We are the words, we are the music, we are the thing itself. Here, Wolf refers to the cotton wool of daily existence, the fact that ordinary perception obscures the world as idea from us, without overt re reference to Schopenhauer, yet she clearly has in mind his view that a metaphorical veil conceals the world as idea from us. 
For Wolf, it is necessary for the writer to see beyond the world of appearances to the world of, as idea and to communicate his experience of the latter to the reader. The works of Shakespeare and Beethoven embody the timeless truths of the world as idea, but there is no Shakespeare, there is no Beethoven, for both are dead, and so too, says Wolf, recalling Nietzsche, is God. The thing itself is to be found partly in living human beings and partly in ex extant works of art and music, which together form a gigantic global pattern. Schopenhauer similarly pictures the world as idea, as existing in both inanimate and an animate and inanimate nature, but he makes no mention of the hidden pattern that Wolf describes. Though hinting at her interest in Schopenhauer in the above, Wolf is at the same time maintaining her status as an independent thinker. Given Wolf's disapproval of the materialistic novelists who write about trivial and transitory things and give us a house in the hope that we may be able to deduce the human beings who live there, we might expect to find to the lighthouse a minimum of references to the ordinary day-to-day -day world as idea, little I. The novel's central section, Time Passes, is concerned in detail, however, with the deterioration of the Ramsay's summer house in the absence of its occupants. Interestingly, it dwells on the materialistic, but does not demand that the reader deduce from the house the human being, beings who live in it, for we have already met them in the first section, the widow, window. And although the phrase, the thing itself, occurs repeatedly in Wolf's essays and reviews, it only appears twice in To the Lighthouse, in The Window, and again in the third part, The Lighthouse. Time Passes serves as a carter between the novel's two other parts, a carter in which Wolf confronts us with two implicit questions. What is the meaning of life, and how can life continue to be meaningful if God does not exist? Being aware of these questions is essential if we are to understand the role played by the thing in itself as in the novel as a whole. In Time Passes, Wolf draws partly on Schopenhauer and partly on the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes to make the point that in the context of eternity, the individual human life is lamentably, lamentably brief and insignificant. In Ecclesiastes, the preacher insists that all is, all is vanity, that in the context of natural process, of the coming and going of the seasons, the rising and setting of the sun, and the endless flow of rivers to the sea, the individual human life is vain, trivial, and meaningless. What profit as the preacher hath a man of all his labor, which he takes under, taketh under the sun? One generation pa passeth away, another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. How is it possible to find meaning and purpose in, in life, given that this is the case? Initially, the preacher has no answer for us, but midway through Ecclesiastes, he says, Behold that which I have seen. It is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him, for it is his portion. Our pleasure in life, in other words, are God-given, and the existence of God is a guarantee not only that life is meaningful, but that everyone will have a portion or share of happiness. In his essay on the vanity of existence, Schopenhauer echoes Ecclesiastes in observing that a man lives for a little while, and then comes a long period where he must exist no more. The heart rebels against this and feels that it cannot be true. In Time Passes, Wolf focuses, as both Schopenhauer and the preacher do, on the brevity of life in relation to eternity, but she differs from the preacher in suggesting that comfort is not necessarily to be found in belief in God. In the midst of a description of the passing of ten years, she comments parenthetically that three characters from the first section in the novel have died before their time, Mrs. Ramsey in her fifties, her daughter Prue in childbirth, and her son Andrew as a young soldier in World War I. Why has a benevolent God denied longevity of life to a devoted mother, a mother-to-be, and a son with great promise as a mathematician? It is as if Cummins Wolf, touched by human penitence and all its toil, divine goodness has parted the curtain and displayed behind it single, distinct, the hair erect, the wave falling, the boat rocking, which did we deserve them, should be ours always. But alas, divine goodness twitching the cord draws the curtain. For our penitence deserves a glimpse only, our toil respite only. The God that Wolf envisions here is one who is not endlessly well disposed to us. He takes intermittent ple pleasures in human activity and is willing to provide us with occasional glimpses of the beauties of his creation, but no more. For his bounty is tempered by disapproval of our sinfulness and our overall lack of penitence. We may be attracted to a belief in God by the usual tokens of divine bounty, the sunset on the sea, the pallor of dawn, the moon rising, and fishing boats against the moon, for example, but the beauties of nature are insufficient to explain the premature death of his creatures. Though the debts might be explicable if we could be certain of God's existence and were aware of his overall plan, Wolf implies that, more probably, God does not exist. 
In time passes, she focuses not just on God and human life, but more specifically on whether God has a role in preserving what humanity has labored to construct. She describes how the Ramsey's holiday home deteriorates over a period of 10 years, how the plaster falls down from the ceiling into the hall, how the rain pipe blocks over the study window and lets water in, how swallows nest in the drawing room and rats gnaw at the holes in the wainscot wainscoting. What power, she asks, could prevent the fertility, the insensibility of nature? Could it be the power of God? In fact, Wolf maintains it is the power of man, and she illustrates this with a reference to the Ramsey's deteriorating summer home, where ongoing natural process is opposed by various tradesmen and two elderly cleaners, Miss McNabb and Mrs. Bast. Significantly, the cleaners are presented to us through the use of a metaphor that appears not in Ecclesiastes, but in Schopenhauer's essay on the vanity of existence. Here he describes life as a voyage and says that when an individual approaches death, he is mostly shipwrecked and comes into harbor with masts and rigging gone. Schopenhauer develops this metaphor more fully in The World as Will and Idea, where he says that life is a sea full of rocks and whirlpools, which man avoids with the greatest care and solicitude, although he knows that even if he succeeds in getting through with all his effort and skill, he yet by doing so comes nearer at every step to the greatest, to and the greatest, the total, the inevitable, and the irremediable shipwreck, death. In time passes, Miss McNabb lurches and rolls like a ship at sea as she prepares the Ramsey's summer cottage for the family's next visit. Similarly, Mrs. Bast heaves and creaks, and both women are threatened by the silent apparition of an ashen-colored ship, death. As they near the end of their lives, their frail barks, a phrase taken from the world as, as well an idea, founder, founder in darkness. Uh, so this, the frail barks, I guess you can just point to in both books. Interesting. The power that prevents the fertility and insensibility of nature from destroying the Ramsey summer house and by extinction the fruits of the labor of men and women more generally is Wolf emphasizes human and limited rather than divine and omnipotent. If, as Wolf suggests, God was only ever a construction of mind devised to confirm meaning and purpose on life, how can we cope with the fact that the individual human life is of no consequence in the context of eternity? Each of the novel's four main characters, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, Charles Tainsley, and Lily Briscoe, solve this problem by finding an alternative to God to place at the center of his or her life. Tainsley and Mr. Ramsey speculate on the status of material objects in the world at large. They discuss, for example, the metaphysical properties of a table, and it, and it is an austere, bare, hard table that engages their attention. Both center their lives not on God, but on the tangible material world and the ability of their rational minds to understand it clearly. Smarter than me, then. It is though they subscribe to Schopenhauer's view that the wealth of Intellect is what makes a man happy. Intellect, such as, when stamped on its productions, will receive the admiration of centuries to come. Thoughts which make him happy at the time, and will in turn be a source of study and delight to the noblest minds of the remote, of the remote posterity. Tansley is untroubled by the thought that his work will eventually be forgotten, because he is thoroughly absorbed in the here and now. Mr. Ramsey, on the other hand, finds it hard to accept that his achievements may fade into obscurity, and this prompts him to turn to his wife for sympathy and support. Significantly, that what Mr. Ramsey offer, Mrs. Ramsey offers him is godlike comfort and protection. If he put implicit faith in her, she assures him nothing should hurt him. However deep he buried himself or climbed high, not for a second should he find himself without her. Here we are put in the, put in the mind of the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The faith Mrs. Ramsey invites her husband to place in her, however, is unsubstantiated, for no human being can be endless a source of bounty. Although she promises her husband that he will never be without her, in fact she dies in her fifties, leaving him without the comfort he so desperately needs. No human being can have the power of God, and this is emphasized in Mrs. Ramsey's choice of the story that she reads to James, in which a fisherman's wife finds that a magic fish will grant her anything she wishes, short of becoming God himself. When Prue reflects, in the window that her mother is the thing itself. What this means in Schopenhauerian terms is that she has detected in her mother qualities of mind superior to those and of other people. Lily Briscoe too discerns the spirit within Mrs. Ramsey, the essential thing that sets her apart from others. She believes that tre treasures of knowledge and wisdom are contained within the older woman's mind and heart, but find them frustratingly inaccessible because people are sealed from one another. 
Mrs. Ramsey is not, however, sealed from the reader, and in Chapter 11 of The Window, when she sits at the end of a busy day with the beam of lighthouse playing on her, we see her at her most obvious Lita Schopenhauerian. This is a long word, Schopenhauerian. Losing personality, one lost the fret, the hurry, the stir, and there rose to her lips away, always, this peace, this rest, this eternity. And pausing there, she looked out to meet the, that stroke of the lighthouse, the long steady stroke, the last of three, which was her stroke, and this thing, the long steady stroke, was her stroke. Often she found herself sitting and looking until she became the thing she looked at, the light, for example. It was odd, she thought, how if one was alone, one learned things, one lent to things, inanimate things, trees, streams, flowers, felt they expressed one, felt they became one, felt they knew one, in a sense were one, felt an irrational tenderness thus, she looked at that long steady light, as for oneself. The above echoes the passage in The, will is will, the World is Well an Idea, the last part of which was quoted earlier. <coughs> if raised by the power of mind a man lets his whole consciousness be filled with the quiet contemplation of the natural object actually present whether a landscape a tree a mountain a building or whatever it may be inasmuch as he loses himself in this object that is forgets even his individuality his will and only continues to exist as the pure subject and can no longer separate the perceiver from the perception then that which is so known is no longer the particular thing as such but it is the idea, the eternal form, and therefore he who is sunk in this perception is no longer individual, for in such perception the individual has lost himself. But he is the pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge. Okay. So that seems like this was the uh, point of the lead-up earlier to make this parallel. Which seems reasonable. Where Schopenhauer says the individual who wants to experience the world as a deer begins by contemplating a landscape, mountain, or building, Ms. Ramsey begins by becoming immersed in a scene of nature that includes a single edifice, the lighthouse. As she withdraws from the events of the day and begins losing the world as idea personality, personality she has employed in her dealings with people, she increasingly feels at one with the scene she is contemplating, especially with the lighthouse itself. In Schopenhauerian terms, she becomes a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge at one with the world as idea. As she returns from this state to the more mundane world, as idea she thinks, we are in the hands of the Lord, and immediately feels irritated with herself. How could any Lord have made this world, she asks. With her mind, she, has always, she always sees the fact that there is no reason, order, justice, but suffering, death, the poor. There was no treachery too base for the world to commit, she knew that. No happiness lasted, she knew that. Schopenhauer similarly observes in the world, world as will and idea that if we are to conduct the... Con Conduct the confirmed optimist through the prisons, torture chambers, and slave kennels over battlefields and places of execution. If we were to open to him all the dark abodes of misery where it hides itself from the glance of cold curiosity, he too would understand at last the nature of this best of all possible worlds. For once did Dante take the materials for his hell, but from this our actual world. And having Mrs. Ramsey identify with the third stroke of the lighthouse, Wolf is hinting at her character as a secular counterpart to the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Holy Spirit. She does this to emphasize that Miss, Mrs. Ramsey is an exceptional character whose spirit pervades the entire novel, even after she has died. Unlike Mr. Ramsey and Tansley, Mrs. Ramsey centers her life not on intellect and on personal success in a career, but rather on her husband and family. Her profound reverence for her husband and love of her children take the place of God when it comes to giving her life meaning and purpose. Like, in, like Schopenhauer and the preacher in Ecclesiastes, she is aware that her life is only a strip, a little strip of time in the context of eternity, and she has chosen to devote it to the service of others. Sometimes she has misgivings. She regrets, for example, that her children must grow up in a world full of suffering while have to experience being wretched, alone, in dreary places. But she is driven by the conviction that people who marry and have children experience far greater happiness in life than those who do not. Significantly, Wolf presents Mrs. Ramsey not only as an individual mother in the Schopenhauerian world as idea, but also as an archetypal figure in world as idea, this little eye now big eye, one who stands for all the mothers who have dedicated themselves to their families over the centuries. Paralleling her presentation of Mrs. Ramsey in the, no in the novel is a passage in The World as Well and Idea, in which Schopenhauer com comments that the, lion the lions which are born and die are like the drops of the waterfall, but the lionitas, the idea or form of a lion, 
is like the unshaken rainbow on Pony. As an individual mother, Mrs. Ramsey corresponds to any one of the lions, yet she is also a human counterpart, more generally the lionitis, no, the timeless idea of lions. It may be tempting to think that if Mrs. Ramsey is an archetypal mother, Lily Briscoe should be taken as her own assessment as a stereotypical old maid. However, we must bear in mind that Wolf links the phrase, the thing itself, not with Lily, but instead with the painting she completes in the final section of the novel. What Lily wants to capture on canvas, Wolf tells us, is that the very jar, that very jar on the nerves, the thing itself before it, has been made anything. From past experience, Lily is all too aware of the frequency with which she glimpses certain aspects of the world as idea, only to have these glimpses lapse back to perception of the time-bound world as idea. So, little big eye world as idea first, and then the time-bound world as idea, small eye. If she were a Schopenhauerian artistic genius, she would have no trouble discerning the idea in both, in in both animate and inanimate nature, then retaining the presence of mind which is necessary to enable her to repeat a voluntary and intentional work which she has learned in this manner. In fact, all in fact, though Lily is an amateur painter who struggles in the window to come once more under the power of that vision, which she has seen clearly once and must now grope for among the hedges and houses and mothers and children, her picture. Significantly, she detects the special idea within Mrs. Ramsey, whose heart and mind seem to her to contain metaphorical tablets bearing sacred inscriptions, which if one could spell them out would teach one everything. Yet it is not the inscriptions alone that Lily wants, but intimacy itself, which is knowledge. She yearns for a spiritual union with Mr. Ramsey, in which she would become, though she does not use Schopenhauerian terminology, a pure, willless, painless, timeless subject of knowledge at one with the older woman's spirit. High regard for Mrs. Ramsey is evident from her first painting, in which she presents Mrs. Ramsey, her son James, as a purple triangle. Mother and son are, as William Banks observes, objects of universal veneration. And just as the third stroke of the lighthouse puts us in mind of the Holy Trinity, so too does the triangle. Yet, at the beginning of the third section of the novel, the lighthouse, Lily is angry that Mrs. Ramsay has made her feel that the painting is less important than getting married and having a family. Earlier, Lily had laughed at Mrs. Ramsay presiding with immutable calm over destinies which she completely failed to understand, but now in the lighthouse she is resentful that the old woman has sapped her self-confidence and made her feel that she was just playing at painting, painting it the one thing one did not play at. Painting, not God, is the one dependable thing in the world of strife, ruin, chaos. In Lily's life, she takes it seriously because it gives her a life meaning and purpose. In The Lighthouse, she moves beyond resenting Mrs. Ramsey at part of the intrusive world as idea to point where she begins losing consciousness of outer things and correspondingly getting glimpses, glimpses of the world as idea. Lily has, such, has had such glimpses in the past, little daily miracles, illuminations, matches struck unexpectedly in the dark, but now as she becomes more and more aware of the timeless, her memory of Mrs. Ramsey guides her towards major revelation. In the midst of chaos, there was a shape. There was shape. This eventually passing and flowing was stuck into stability. Life stands still here, Mrs. Ramsey said. Mrs. Ramsey, Mrs. Ramsey, she repeated. She owed this revelation to her. Of course, the task remaining of committing the revelation to Canvas and Lily is initially troubled that she might not be able to do so satisfactorily. One wanted, she thought, dipping her brush deliberately, deliberately to be on a level with ordinary experience, to feel simply that it's a chair, that's a table, and yet, at the same time, it's a miracle, it's an ecstasy. If the problem remains unsolved, if the painting fails to communicate Lily's experience with the world as idea, it may end up being hung in, in an attic or rolled up and shoved under a sofa. Nevertheless, Lily is willing to take that risk because she has made painting, not God, the center of her life. She may not be a great painter, meaning in Schopenhauerian terms an artistic genius who readily discerns the world as idea in nature and has no difficulty committing her vision of it onto canvas. Yet in the closing lines of the novel, Lily has clearly achieved something remarkable. It was done, it was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue, I have had my vision. Once completed, Lily's painting is expressive of her experience of the world as idea and is, as an, is an example of her personal Schopenhauerian religion of art. In spite of her echo of Christ's last words on the cross, however, this private religion is not to be confused with conventional Christianity. 
As Lily finishes the painting, old Mr. Carmichael stood be beside her, looking like an old pagan god, shaggy with weeds in his hair and the trident, it was only a French novel, in his hand. If we are alive to the fact that Lily and Mr. Ramsey are the two characters in the novel who are aligned with the life of the spirit, Mr. Ramsey and Tansley, with speculation about the material world, this brief, slightly comic reference to a mythical sea god will put us in mind of words with the world is too much with us, in which the poet begins by inveighing against the materialism of his day, and in the closing lines exclaims, Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so I might, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn, having sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. For Wolf, the creed outworn is Christianity, or more exactly, the Judeo-Christian belief that God exists through his holy, through his bounty conferred, God exists and through his bounty confers meaning and purpose on human endeavor. Repeatedly skeptical about the existence and benevolence of God in time passes, Wolf ultimately suggests that for her, as for Lily, the timeless idea is what must feature in 20th century art. Where fiction is concerned, she dismisses the materialist Bennett, Wells, and Galsworthy, for they write of unimportant things. They spend immense skill and immense industry making the trivial and the transitory appear the true and the enduring. The proper subject of the modern novelist Wolf believes is the timeless and spiritual. We see this clearly in her Schopenhauerian theory of art as developed in her essays and in her practice as a writer of fiction into the lighthouse, the most Schopenhauerian of her novels. Oh, and that's it. I was like, are there another two pages going? There might have been, but there's just a bunch of notes and references. Okay, cool. So, this um is a Schopenhauerian analysis of Virginia Woolf, and specifically to the lighthouse. Um, I'm experts on neither of those topics, so it looks like it turns mostly on the uh, certain passages that seem to push the two uh, very close together. Now, I don't know enough to really know if they are representative passages, but it looks like the author has gone to some lengths to show that they are important things, and there are things like frail barks um, that may have been taken, it says phrase taken from this, but I mean, the fact that there is one phrase that was taken, and the thing in itself thing is not strict evidence, but it's still reasonable to... Um, think that this is a, that Wolf may have had been influenced by such uh, Schopenhauer. Um, otherwise, this is a little bit of a, so it's kind of expository on uh, the Schopenhauerian ideal as Wolf presents it. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say about that because this is just sort of the uh, it's an aesthetic theory that basically says you need this direct access to the way things are when the uh, uh, the direct access of the will when it intermixes with something outside the self and the individual sort of falls away so you lose the uh, particular psychological psychological aspect of the person and then you just have a direct sort of intermingling with some part of the idea as it were which is something that's uh, more timeless than our short lives as was repeated in this paper. Um, that's cool. So, I mean, that's fine. Uh, I don't have much to say because it wasn't like an analysis of that. It was just sort of showing how these writers sort of, uh, will sort of fit into this mold. So, that's it for now. I'll be back again, I guess, tomorrow morning. And uh, have a great night and stay safe, everybody out there. Bye-bye.